Welcome to our monthly Power Girls Education Hour. We do this every month and we have an amazing special guest in every month to share with us something that's going to help us in either our personal lives or our businesses, sometimes both. But just we've had some amazing speakers come in and we we just always get really good feedback. So I'm super excited today to invite an old friend of mine as well as Jess's, uh, Christina Wise. Christina, thank you so much for, for what you're going to share with us today. Tell us, introduce yourselves and I'll just go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> it's great to meet you all and... I love Power Girls Live. That's just the greatest title ever. I'm going to even push it up a notch and I'm going to call it Financially Powerful Girls. <laughs> and that's what I, my whole passion is for women to become financial powerhouses. And the way we do that is to really embrace this conversation about money, that we want to talk about it, learn about it, share about it. Um discuss it around the dinner table, discuss it amongst, amongst ourselves, because that's that's the only way we're really going to, to own it. And it's funny, just what came across my desk this week, which coincidentally has it on top of my mind, but in 1970, women could not have their own credit card. And women couldn't be on a bank account on their own. And women couldn't be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. So the list goes on, but you think about that. It's it's not been that long ago. I mean, that meant my mother couldn't have a credit card on her own. That's, that's just my mother. So to think that we have come a long way, which is awesome, but also... Since money is rather a newer thing generally generationally for women, there, you know, maybe we have a little catch up to do in a way. So what I found is that we as women today, we're really good at making money, like we're creating businesses. 50% of all business small businesses created are created by women. So women, 55% of women are going to college and getting advanced degrees, like more women than men. So when it goes to advanced education, when it goes to starting businesses, when it goes to making money, man, I mean, we're just in a totally different place. Like we can earn anything we want to, but what happens with money is it breaks down from there <laughs> that there many times is this fear of money that, that we just get stuck in. Hey, I don't know a lot about money beyond earning it. So if I just make enough money, then all my money problems are going to go away. So I like to teach that there's a lot more to the money equation than just trying to make more of it. Do we want to make a lot of it? Yes. But I think what we want to do beyond just making and earning high incomes is we want to build something called financial freedom. So in the chat, and if you guys, I want to have a conversation so if you guys, you know, want to come off mute or ask any questions, I think I just see my big face here. Let me see if I can switch it where I can see everybody else. I don't need to see me. Here we go. So if you want to come off mute or whatever, like ask some questions, like let's really engage in this. And that's a big part of the growth is for us to get over the fear of asking questions and to put ourselves out there. So I'm going to challenge us to do that today. But before I jump into anything, Jess, is there anything that you really wanted me to talk about today or share or anything that is you think is something to focus on? Yeah, I just, um, I mean, the planning for me is more fun and easier than actually executing the day-to-day -day stuff. But this time of year, I start thinking about the last quarter and the next year and, you know, oh crap, what did we say a year ago? And all, all of those things, but I've been in Christina's circle for a couple of years now, and I have taken her courses and she's been a huge influence on me and she's amazing. So I'm just excited to, I really love how you teach planning. It's a little bit different. And I know we don't have time for all of the details of it, but just 
you know, starting with your ideal life. And that doesn't equal like the amount of revenue you need to earn, like all the different, the way money can flow and some of the mindset stuff and just planning on, you know, whether it's in one year or three years, um, you know, how to work backwards and reverse engineer business planning. Awesome. Easy peasy. Okay. So when we get started, if you can, if you're not driving, type in the chat box, what is your relationship with money? Like if you could just put it in a few words or a sentence, how would you describe it? And it can be something like, I love money. I love making money. I want to be rich. I love, um, I'm terrified of money. I avoid my money. I hide from my money. Like whatever that relationship is. Complicated. Great. I love it. Awesome. I like making it and spending it. Perfect. Good. All right. Yeah, keep those coming in because we'll talk a little bit about the relationship. I respect what it can do for me. Awesome. I can't wait to work on this relationship more and, and more. Great. So let me start by sharing that there are these, what I like to talk about just, just in context, and then we can drill in a little bit more deeper. So in, in the macro, money has like these three legs. It has these three parts. And when we're in this money game, there's usually two, two goals or two things we're after. And the first place that we're really, whether we know it or not, what we want is what's called financial security. And what financial security is, it means that when it comes to money, we feel secure. We feel safe. There's We have enough money sitting around. It, it doesn't mean if something goes wrong that you know next week or next month is going to be really stressful. So that's that first goal is like, hey, how do I create financial security that that money is a, a secure, it's secure in my life and it offers a lot of security. From there, then we want to, after financial security, we're really working towards that financial freedom and that freedom. So type in the chat box if you don't mind, and I'll be coming back to this later. What is financial security and what is financial freedom? So just take a second. What is financial security to you? And what is financial freedom? And I ask these questions because it's really important that we have distinctions for some of these feelings. You know, we as women, we tend to feel. <laughs> and so we like, I want to feel financially secure. I want to feel this sense of freedom. But what does it mean just technically? Like, how does it show up practically? All right, great. I'm going to come back to these. So if you want to put anything else in there, we'll talk about these in a second. Because that's when we're in the money game. Like I said, there's these, these different parts. And so the first part is financial security. And think of three legs of a stool. So three legs of a stool means if you're going to have a stool that's secure, that's going to be able to sit on and it's not going to topple over, it needs at least three, three legs. It can go four legs. It turns into a chair, probably have more. But we need at least three legs to a stool or a chair for it to be secure. And money has these three legs to it. And so what that means is we need to have all three of these legs of money to create financial security, to move us to this place of, of where, again, I feel secure. Things can go awry and I know I'm not going to, you know, show up in the poorhouse somewhere, which can be that, that fear, that subconscious fear when we don't have that security. So the first leg of the stool is what's called mindset. We've heard money mindset. And there are lots of those of my peers out there that teach mindset. So I don't go deep into it, but mindset is just crucial in the sense that if we have limiting beliefs around money, it's going to limit our money in all categories. And so it's just knowing and doing the work that, that to create this financial security, we have to do this work of addressing our mindset. And what your mindset is, what our mindsets are, where they come from, our money mindsets come from our parents and our culture, <laughs> but mostly from our parents. And so if you or we have not done any money mindset work, it is very likely that we're still running around with, our, with the mindset of our seven-year-old self. 
And what that means is we're carrying, we're believing the stories and just beliefs about money that our parents gave us. They programmed us and our parents program us, meaning we all speak English because our parents spoke English. Well, they spoke a money language and we've adopted that money language and those beliefs, whether we know it or not. And the way to test this is to see if we're all moms here, those of us that are moms, see if you catch yourself saying the same thing to your kids as your mom said to you or your parents said to you. Like it's just carried on. So it's just really important that we look at mindset and you do a little money mindset work and just write down what are these limiting beliefs that I have about money and do it alone. It's really fun as a group exercise. And so maybe if you guys do a little workshop or something, talk about this and just talk about, hey, this is what my parents said, or this is what my mom said, and this is what my dad said. And it's really good to even look at the different parents, like what your dad said compared to what your mom said. And and just then think like, do I carry on these same beliefs? And then just do the work to rewrite them and replace them. Part of what I do in my money school, in my in my course that Jess is referring to, is we we write a story to money. We write a letter to money. And you actually write a letter to money that says exactly how you feel about it. And it's just between you, yourself, the pen and paper. So you can be completely honest because no one's ever going to read it. And it's just fascinating what comes out of our subconscious by doing this exercise. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time there, but just to know that, that these mindsets really cause a lot of financial limitations that we're not aware of because they're so deeply subconsciously programmed. The second leg of the stool is what I call your relationship with money. And your relationship sometimes mindset gets combined with relationship, but relationship with money is different. Our relationship with money is how we relate to it. And if we procrastinate looking at our money, if we avoid our money, if we don't talk to our money, if we don't spend time with our money, if we um, all, you know, anything that has us a distant or non-existent real relationship with our money, it's unhealthy. And what that means is that that type of relationship is not going to create the financial security and freedom that we're all after. So that's part of the rule of money is that we have to have this relationship where we're like in partnership with our money. And you think of really good marriages, you know, really good marriages, they spend time together, they talk together, they have goals together, they have different roles, they have they have similar values they respect they respect the other's values they're aligned you know so um but if you were in a marriage and there's no communication there's no time spent there's a lot of avoidance there's a lot of complaining bitching griping all those things you can see that that's not going to pull the couple closer together it's probably going to pull them farther apart so and all the relationship stuff that I've you know, learned is that that one person can change a marriage by changing the relationship by one person quits complaining, one person quits bitching, one person starts to set up the dates, one person changes themselves, and then the whole marriage starts changing. So we do that with our money is we want to have like, for lack of better words, like a healthy marriage with our money, where we have time, we have dates with our money, we spend time with it, we count it, Instead of bitching and complaining, you know, either, you know, explicitly or just in our head about not enough money or that, we want to change that by by having a lot of gratitude and appreciation for the money we do have and the things coming in. And it's really important that we develop this relationship with money. Now, how these two are very tightly connected is that if we believe something like money is complicated or I'm not good with math or money is for you know greedy people if those beliefs are there that's going to affect our relationship where we're not going to want to have this really tight connected relationship with our money so they go hand in hand but it's just to understand that these two are different and we want to start embracing our money so part of the again the money school over the 12 weeks it's it's gaining this relationship by being forced time with your money by doing the work and what happens over spending this time is like, oh my gosh, I used to be afraid of my money. I'd be afraid to look at it. I just, I don't know, I'd get 
bad butterflies on my stomach, if I had to open up my credit card statements or my bank accounts, and it moves to, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get into my bank accounts this month. I can't wait to be able to track it. I can't wait to talk to somebody about it. So that's that's the relationship. And the third piece is what I call, call the skill set of money. And there's only 9% of American households, which are millionaires, 9%. So that means 91% of this country are not millionaires. And that's, there's, there's a reason for that, but it's because we are financially illiterate. We do not have financial competency because it's not taught in school. The most important things aren't taught in school how to have a healthy body, mind, and spirit, how to have a healthy marriage and communicate well, how to build wealth and abundance. You know, these real life skills aren't taught in school. Instead, we spent time, I don't know, would we spend time on history? Maybe that's relevant, I don't know. But money wasn't taught in school. And if we haven't spent the time to learn that money has these first principles, that money has laws, principles, mechanics that have to be followed, and if you betray them, money will betray you. It will feel like a sense of money betrayal. And it's just responding to the first betrayal. <laughs> and so when we don't understand how money operates at, you know, kind of at this foundational fundamental level, we self-sabotage without knowing it. And it's that self-sabotage that keeps 91% of American households more or less month to month that it's like, okay, I have to go sell houses next month to pay last month's bills. And that's called the hustle, the rat race, keeping up with the Joneses. Like we all get in these feelings of, man, no matter how hard I work, I just can't seem to get ahead. And man, I sold three more houses last year than I did the year or this year than last year, but I'm no farther ahead. Or, oh shit, I sold three, six houses less this year than last year. And now I'm even worse because the economy is so much worse. What do I do? And that's, again, that goes back to that lack of financial security, because when we have financial security, we're so less dependent on where the economy is in these ups and down cycles, because we have a secure base that supports us. So those are these three parts of money that, that all go together. And if we want to create that financial security, that wealth, and ultimately that financial freedom, we can't ignore any one of those legs of the stool. We have to invest in learning, we have to invest time, and we have to really work on, on changing that mindset. It's, you know, it's really the only way. And the good thing is, the positive thing of that is, is money is not complicated. You know, we've been, I remember my daughter, my daughter's 28 now, and she teaches exactly what I'm teaching. So um, she's, she's amazing. She's, well on her way to become a millionaire at 28 already. But I remember it was she was a freshman in high school and she came home and she had some math homework and she's like, man, I hate math. I'm terrible at math. And just was going on and on and on sitting at the kitchen island as we're doing homework time after school. And I said, who told you you were bad at math? And she said, I don't know. I'm just mad at math. And I said, well, what if you weren't bad at math? What if you told your body you were good at math? And she's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, just that, just start telling yourself versus replacing these words, I'm bad at math. Let's replace it with, I'm good at math. And with your permission, anytime I hear you say that, I'll just gently nudge you to, to say the other words. And we did that for a while. And I mean, I kid you not, she went from sucking at math because she had a narrative that she hated it to being straight A at math and science for nothing more than changing whatever that programming. And I don't know if I did it or culture did it or what did it, but she just started telling herself she's good at math. And she, she told me like, math just isn't that hard. <laughs> like it really may be more advanced things, but she wasn't trying to get to, you know, I don't know, secondary degree calculus or something or trigonometry, but when it just comes to math. So these stories we tell ourselves get in our way. And the great thing about investing a little bit of time and money to really learn the skill of money, it's so simple. It's middle school math, but because it's math, it's guaranteed results. Like it's an equation that when you follow the simple formula, what the equals, what's on the other side of equals is wealth and abundance in real dollars that show up in your bank account. So these are, it's just to know that 
money is not hard. If we've been believed to think that it's hard, we've been told a message maybe that keeps us, you know, giving our money to people that we think smarter to, to manage our money or to, to invest our money than we are. So those are the three legs. I'm going to just um, see if you guys have any questions on that or any comments before I move on. I just any? think it's great. It's such a reminder and, you know, moving from a place of scarcity, I'm, I, I don't have my video on, sorry, I thought I did. <laughs> um, but moving from a place of scarcity to abundance is like a huge mindset shift that you have to be willing to take. And I feel like that's been a really big one for me for the past like five years. But, and so I thought, while I was there, but what you're saying is resonating so much. Like I need that 12 week class. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's a, and the abundance is, is part of it's, we can move very quickly from scarcity to abundance and abundance is a journey. Like you get into this and you realize like, oh, there's more and I can create more and build more and have more. And the abundance just continues to flow into more abundance, which is nice. But there's the mindset piece that basically says, hey, I am worthy of any, any amount of wealth. Like I'm worthy, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough. I'm a creator, I'm a doer, I, I'm, I take care of people, my heart's in the right place, all of that. So it starts there, but then it just flows into more abundance. So thank you, Mary. So I'll just share a little story is that, you know, I, I like to tell the story that I actually started in a trailer home. So I started out with, the, and it wasn't even like a double wide. It was like a little teeny tiny single wide, barely bigger than a, a travel trailer. And my upbringing started, I mean, there was a lot of alcoholism, a lot of fighting, poverty, you know, all the things you can imagine in that type of background, small town. And so I was very motivated to make money and I became, I became really good at making it. And I got into real estate in my kind of mid to late twenties. And I, I sold a lot of real estate. I mean, I made hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. I went on, I built my own real estate brokerage. I, I did business nationwide. And so I, um, I was like top 100 leaders in real estate. So I, I was, I, most of my career was in real estate and what happened though is about five years in, no, about seven years into selling, and here I was top sales in the city and and definitely in my company. And I ended up getting divorced. And what was so interesting at the time is that I was making more money than I could ever imagine. And I'd built this really nice business. And like I said, I got on all that my company stages and and um the business journal, like all the awards that you you can get in real estate. And after year after year after year, and a couple of things happened. It's about five years into this in December would happen. And I'd get on the stage and I'd get all these top producer awards and it felt amazing. And my ego was really big. So I worked really hard for all those awards because I was very award motivated. But then on January 1, I had to start again, like from zero and do it all over again to wind up on the stage in December of the following year. And again, the first few years it felt great, but then it was about, I don't know, year five or six, I realized, what the hell, I have to start over again from zero to get all the wards and to make all the money. And I just have to go hustle and sell more houses and create another marketing plan, like all the things. And that's, it didn't completely clicked, but it was starting to dawn on me then that there's got to be something different than this. It just, I don't like starting at zero all the time. And it wasn't a zero, you know, starting January one, but it's like starting at zero at the beginning of every month. And, but I just kept working harder. If I was low on money, I just do an extra open house and sell an extra house and somehow cover the bills. And it seemed to be working. Seven years into it, I ended up getting a divorce and it was a terrible divorce there aren't a lot of things I'm ashamed of in my life, but how I acted in that divorce is, I, you know, I, I probably cleaned the shame, but, you know, it's just shameful behavior. And we fought over so much stupid shit, like all the crap that, you know, fighting over houses and cars and boats. And I mean, it's just so stupid in hindsight. And 
what happened is I ended up out of that divorce and I'd focused all my attention on getting my fair share out of this divorce. And I wasn't selling houses or paying attention. And I didn't even think about money because if I had to do something, I'd sell an extra house. So coming out of that, it's funny, like on this one day I celebrated with my colleagues at work because it was just this horrible divorce and my poor children at the time. And then about a week later, I realized like, oh, shoot, I don't have any money. And I realized that I moved out of the big house because we had to sell it and we thought fought over that. And I was a primary wage earner. So the courts gave me where I had to pay child support and where I had to cover all these activities. I'd not paid attention to my business. So I hadn't been lead generating. I didn't have any clients in the queue. And I came out of this totally broke. There, I had a lot of debt. I put a lot of stuff on credit cards and I could not, I mean, I didn't have enough money to be able to put the deposits down on my rent, to be able to turn on the utility bill. And it just hit me like, I have no money and I have all this debt and I have to pay child support. And I mean, I, it just, I crumbled. I, I, I was so terrified for this first time because it's funny that it didn't even occur to me where the money was and all the stuff. I just thought it was going to be fine. And the only thing that got us through that time with me, like now I'm a single mom in real estate. We know single mom, full-time career, 100% commission. And I thought, how the hell am I going to support two babies? They were three and four at the time on being a, you know, hundred percent commission single mom. And how am I going to like take care of them? I mean, I just didn't even know. And it was colleagues at work, peers at work that actually came in. They pitched in, they brought over blankets and towels. They, they put the deposits on the utility bills and they basically totally took care of our expenses for six months, paid for my car because my car was about to be repossessed. I mean, all the things. And on one hand, I would thank God, I still to this day have so much gratitude for, I mean, I didn't ask, they just figured out, somehow figured out what was going on and pitched in and rallied together. So, and this was called the East Wing, which were all the top producers had this wing of my real estate company. And we called ourselves the East Wing and we had our own little door. So I was part of this top producer network. And here I was, I could not pay my bills. So I was so grateful for them to, to do that. But on the other hand, I just felt so much shame because we had to take handouts as, as, as children. Like we could never buy our own stuff. Everything was secondhand and everything was handouts. And and I had a lot of shame about that growing up. And then here I am as an adult with my children being in the same situation. And I mean, I just, the the lowest, darkest, most horrible moment is I am like bawling on the floor and my two little kids are on top of me saying, mommy, mommy, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. They didn't know what I was crying about because I was just breaking down and I'm not a big crier. And that just woke me up. And it woke me up to think, how the hell did I make all of that money? And I'm here completely broke. I am completely broke. Like I have to take charity to be able to put food on the table for my two children. And I couldn't understand it. I mean, I was just so oblivious. And that was this pivotal moment. It was out of that moment where I realized that there's more to this money game than meets the eye. It's not just about selling a lot of houses and making a shit ton of money. It's more than that. And that sent me on this personal crusade to learn money. And then I read all the books and I went to the workshops and just all of the things to, you know, to be where I am today. And today I have an eight figure net worth and I've lost all my money more than once and rebuilt it again, which you learned kind of the skills and I won't do that again. But I just tell that story to, because it's just, to me, it's just such an example of this hustle culture that's just all about just, you know, make more money, sell more houses, have a better marketing plan, do more lead gen. It's all just around spending time to try to make more money. And I'm all about money. I like, I like making money, make no mistake, but just understand there's more to it and we're not taught the more to it. And that's the piece that we, again, these principles that I'm referring to. And once I learn these things and put these principles in place, money just started taking care of itself. And then that turned into the financial security. And then that turned into the abundance and that turned in eventually to the freedom. So that's why I'm, I have this personal passion today to want to teach this is that, that, Hey, there actually is a formula, a method, a very prescriptive um, 
framework and and behavior pattern, mindset and behavior pattern to money. And I equate it to like, um, if we wanted to put on a bunch of muscle mass, if we wanted to lose weight and put on muscle mass, that we don't have to focus on gaining muscle every time we go to the gym. What we have to focus on is what we eat. What we have to focus on is maybe how much we sleep. And what we need to focus on are the heavy weights we lift. And if we're eating a, you know, semi-healthy diet, we're getting enough sleep, we drink some clean water, and we get to the gym and, and lift those heavy weights according to a protocol that's guaranteed to create muscle, the muscle is going to happen automatically. It's just the byproduct of all those materials or all those things before it. And that's what wealth is. Wealth is the byproduct of all the things that we do before it. So what those things are is really important. But we, it starts with this desire to be wealthy. And it can't be, it can't be iffy. It can't be like, oh yeah, I want to be financially secure. Oh yeah, I want to be financially free because everybody does. It comes with a resolute stake in the ground that says, I want to be a net worth millionaire or multimillionaire or whatever your number is. And it's a stake in the ground. And you stick it in there and you're like, this is what I want and I'm going to get it and I'm going to do what it takes to make that happen. But it, and it starts with clarity. Like if it's a million dollars net worth or whatever that is, you have to have a very clear number. That's one of the financial principles and it's called how much money is enough. And you need to know like how much net worth do I need to be financially secure and how much net worth do I need to be financially free? And then once you know those two numbers, we can reverse engineer into what we need to do on a you know month to month and year to year basis to make sure that we hit that financial target. And there's many milestones along the way, but we can't hit a financial destination if we don't know what that destination is. It, it, it can't be loosey goosey. And that means that we have to go back to that money mindset and that relationship with money because we have to feel very good and confident to want to set those, you know, that stake, that flag in there in the first place. And then the, the doing what it takes means, hey, what do I need to learn? What do I need to read? Or who do I need to mentor from? Or whatever the things are. So that's that piece. So I'll go into, how much time do I have? Just I'll spend like five more minutes and then we can, um, well, I'll, look in the chat and we'll talk about that and I'll answer any questions. But it's to understand too, these fundamental pieces of money. So there's these three legs of the stool that I talked about. And that's what I do. I, I teach the skill set of money, the financial literacy and competency that once we know these things, like I said, you put these things in place, how I teach it. And the byproduct is the financial security and wealth. Like I said, we just put the dominoes in front of that. The other thing is there's these three categories of money. And this is the part that I think is the most misunderstood thing about money, what makes money complicated or nebulous or, or difficult to try to rein in is we haven't been taught about these three parts. And these three parts of money are very distinct meaning they, they're they so distinct that they need their own time, attention, consciousness, thoughtfulness, um, goals, tra like all the things. So they're that distinct, but what happens, they get conflated. So they get confused when they're talking about just out there, you know, wherever money's talked about. And then, but also they're very synergistic. So even though they're very distinct and separate, they're very much connected and work together. It's like our body is one system that has these parts that work together. So we have a brain, our heart, our gut, our you know nervous system, our circulatory. We have all these systems, which are these unique parts that do a very specific job, but they all work in tandem together. So if one's not working, it's gonna affect the others. But one of the parts on its own may be in poor health. So we need to fix that part. <laughs> so this is the three parts of money. And out of, out of everything I teach, this is the most important thing to really understand. It's the basis of everything else. And the first part is making money. So that's its own category. And there, this 
making money. And if we're all here in real estate, that means that's what we're doing to make money. And, and the more we build ourselves as a business and create a leverage business, we can be self-employed and just go out and sell houses, or we can build kind of a real estate business where maybe we have a buyer's agent or a showing agent and an assistant and whatever the case is, there's a spectrum there, but that's all around the answering the question, how do I make more money? And that's the problem to solve. The problem is to solve is how do I make more money? And there's no reason why that is always the case. And I like making more money year over year over year. Now, it doesn't mean that um, that's the only thing that's important, but that's part of the challenge. It's like, hey, Christina, how do I make more money this year than I made last year? And then I go all to the problem solving, the planning to figure out how to do that and put a business plan in place and, and start with some of these questions that Jessica's referring to. But that bucket one is all about how do I make more money? And there's the specific piece to that. If in real estate, then we're maybe looking at like, hey, I need a better marketing plan or, hey, what am I doing on social media to generate more leads or whatever we do to be able to answer that question, how do I make more money in my business? And that's that one bucket. And it's really important when we are in real estate that we we separate ourselves from our money in the sense that we want that money to throw through its own bank account. We don't, you know, I really advise that you don't commingle your business money with your personal money, set yourself up as an LLC, these different things that are a little bit more, you know, um, uh, complex, I guess. But the idea is that that's, I'm creating this container of money through my work and my earnings and the money that's left over after all my expenses, meaning I'm going to go sell a bunch of houses, but when I take out my commission split, when I take out my um, signs and when I take out my lunches and when I take out my gas and when I take out all the marketing, I have something that's left over called profit. And we take that profit and we pay ourselves out of the business account, hopefully into the household account. So now that household account is the second container. It's the second part of money. And it's distinct from the earning because in the household account, our job now is to manage the money in a way that there's surplus. Because how you build financial security and wealth and ultimately financial freedom is based on how much less than you spend than you make. So that's out of household finance. So that second bucket is that we want to be like the CFO of our household finance. And our job is to see our job as the CEO of our business is to make a bunch of profits. We can make, you know, so we can pay ourselves a nice, healthy profit salary. We move that to our household. Now our job at as a household is to manage our money to make sure that we're spending consciously and that we're underspending, that we spend less than we make. And the reason why there's only 9% of millionaires in this country, net worth millionaires, is because something called Parkinson's law of money. And Parkinson's law of money says that expenses will always rise to match income. And what that means is that if we are first year in real estate, we make fifty thousand. We're going to spend fifty thousand. Second, third year, we make a hundred thousand. Our lifestyle increases to a hundred thousand, and this is that's called the rat race. And everybody's in it without knowing it. And if you are not managing your money, if you're not counting it, managing it, looking at where it's going, tracking, setting up different buckets of money to make sure that you don't spend it all, you're falling into the trap of Parkinson's law. And it's just as natural as breathing. It's not because we're greedy or bad people or irresponsible or any of the things. It's just a natural law that takes effect if we're not paying attention. So that's what we do. That second container is whenever our household gets paid, it's our job to really manage the money for wealth creation. And we need to learn how to do that. And there's... there's the, I mean, that's what I do is I teach the methodology for how to do that. And your money needs different jobs and it needs to be in different buckets and different accounts. And there, there's a, you know, I teach a whole method for how to do this for wealth creation, but bottom line is you have to spend less than you make. 
And if you know your numbers, you know how you need to know how much how much less than you make do you need to be able to keep? Because financial security is cash. So what financial security is, is if you have no money sitting around in separate accounts, like a rainy day bucket or just cash in different savings accounts or whatever, in your month to month, that's lack of financial security. That's what financial stress is. When every single month we, we don't have savings and if something happens, we don't have money set aside, that that's lack of security. So the only way to create financial security is we have to have savings. We have to have that cash savings, that money sitting around. And that's why we hear, you know, any person that's in the money space that says rainy day fund, rainy day fund, rainy day fund, but you have to have a rainy day fund. Why? Because the more cash you have, the more financially secure you feel. And that's a feeling. So if you have $5,000 of cash as opposed to zero, that's a little bit more secure. But if you have $100,000 of cash sitting around, that's a whole different level of financial security. Meaning like, hey, if we don't sell any houses, we're okay for a while because our expenses are only X and we, you know, we have a lot of cash sitting around. So the more cash we have, the more secure we are. That's what financial security is. So the first step in creating financial security is starting to build those cash accounts. And you need more than one. But that's that second container. And again, that's all about how you spend your money, how well you spend it, and how well you manage it to spend it appropriately so you don't overspend. And it comes with paying off debt. If we get into credit card debt, we need to get rid of it, blah, blah, blah. The third container. The third container then is called net worth. And this is something called a personal balance sheet. So it's the first step one is to create that financial security. But financial freedom is something different than financial security. Financial freedom shows up on a balance sheet. It's called net worth. And it's a number, which is a number that's attached to the value of your assets, the value of your money. And it's the what called the wealth game. So most, when I say 91% of Americans are in what's called the income game. They're hustling to try to make more money, thinking more money will solve all the money problems. The 9% are what's called they're in the wealth game. So they understand that wealth exists on a balance sheet. And so they're equally, those that are in the wealth game are just as excited to track and look at their and grow their balance sheet is they are looking at tracking and growing their income. And that's the difference between the wealthy or those that I'm talking to teach to become on the millionaire or the wealth track. It is the key difference. It's the only difference really between the wealthy and the, the 9% and the 91% is that they're equally excited about growing their net worth and focus on the balance sheet as they are about growing their income. It's both at the same time. And if you're just focused on making more money, which would show up on a profit and loss and not focused on growing your balance sheet, that's the trap. And we get stuck in the trap. So that's that, that piece is on a balance sheet. And that's what I want women, the women to be what I just called feminine financial power. I want women to own that fucking balance sheet, to know what it is, to want to grow it, to understand it, to not be afraid of it, to talk about it, to talk amongst ourselves about it. And yeah, let's talk about how to make more money or how much we're making or all, you know, our real estate tips and tricks. But there's all sorts of stages, like all the real estate stages I've been on or gone to and all the hundreds of real estate conferences, there's no shortage of different talks on how to make more money in real estate. There are way too few talks on how to get rich with real estate. And that makes me mental. It's just such a disservice to our industry because everything's about how to make more money and not how to become wealthy. We're in real estate. We should be getting real estate. We should be getting wealthy in real estate, not just selling real estate. But we're not going to do that if we don't embrace this desire to create wealth and to know we are smart enough and we are we can do all the things and all of that and want to like from our heart inside out and want to do this for our kids and our families and, and all of the things. 
So that's the, that's that third category. And it's to understand now I've worked with a lot of women who are really financially secure, meaning they have businesses, a lot of real estate agents, agents, but other women business owners that have multi, you know, seven figure businesses but they have hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in cash accounts because that makes them feel very financially secure and nothing invested because they're terrified to invest the money because they're afraid to lose it because that feels not financially secure. So it's to understand wealth is different. I really have to work on a lot of mindset stuff and we have to do some things to help them, you know, um, let some of that money go out of that cash account because it's, it's not as secure as they think. So that money can start making money and growing itself and start growing that net worth. So those are the three buckets. And I'll just circle that around to say that, that, you know, money is just such a fun subject. It's just, it's so like, once you embrace it and learn it and start to grow it and do these things, it's amazing how it just transcends to every category of life. Like you just walk with a different skip in your step and like the shoulders go back and you stand straight up when you understand this money game, like there's something to it and it feels really great. So that's what I want to do. I just love being invited to have conversations about money, open up conversations about money, make having conversations a safe topic, no matter where we are in our, you know, whatever financial situation we have so that we as women can come together to help each other, not just make more money, but create more wealth and build amazing legacies. All right. What questions do you guys have? Where do I sign up? <laughs> awesome. You know what I'll do, Mary, is um, I'm going to put a link. I'm Dawn, by the way. Mary, I don't know where Mary went, but remember I signed in and under her yeah. so I could get signed in. And right, I took yeah. your class. I took one of your classes in Austin, Christina. I don't, I know you don't remember me because that was like 10 years ago, but it was just, it was amazing. And it was so eye opening and but I feel like over the past years since then, like I've always just got stuck on the making money and I never feel like I'm at a point where I can work on the next step. And now I'm at a point where I want, I'm ready to work on that next step and build the wealth from the money. Awesome. And that's, it's, it's that's all it is. It's like, when you're ready, it's like, now I'm ready. Once you're like at that ready point, it's easy. So I put my link that's to my calendar. So I'd really love for each of you just to set up a call and we'll just do like a 45 or 60 minute chat. Tell me where you are. I'll let you know if I, I, I'll answer any questions. I'll give any advice and I'll, you know, if there's anything I can help you with, I'll share, um, I'll share that also. And yeah, Don, it, I do remember you by the way. And yeah, so again, just, I always like to say that the entire all the narrative out there is about making more money. So we've been programmed that that's the only thing we need to focus on. So I always like to say like, yeah, of course, that's all you've been focused on because that's all that goes in our ears and that's all we see. So it's combined with kind of the, the worldwide narrative out there is make more money, hustle more, grind more, do more, be more, have more. And we get trapped in that thing. And then all the marketing is telling us, oh, you're not good enough. <laughs> so you need to buy all these things to be good enough, to measure up, to, you know, you're too old, you're too young, you're too this, you're too fat, you're too skinny. Like whatever all that stuff is, it separates us from our money basically is what it's doing. So yeah, when we can let go of that narrative and create our own, then we can start doing the work. But it's just to say like, yeah, of course, that's what we're focused on because that's all we're basically told from any type of marketing that comes across our screens, which by the way, I'm just amazed at like everything's an ad these days. Are you guys just like, everything is turning into more ads and more ads and more ads. I, I, I'm just, I don't know why it's, it's hitting me all of a sudden that everywhere I go, it's even more ads. And so that's just saying, it's not going to get easier it's getting harder because we're in, we're being even more inundated on every device, everything with another ad. So yeah. And what, it's we... ads of people selling things now. It's like not just the company selling the net cream. It's like all these people talking to you about this really does work. Buy it. Like I'm a sucker. I bought it. 
<laughs> it'd work <laughs> but I'm just saying like you're like oh I want to be more like her or you're right it's so true like just stay off of social media yeah really yeah protect ourselves and that's part of what we do in the class is you give yourself an allowance like you get an allowance like hey I can spend this on whatever ad comes across and we'll see if it works or not but if not without these allowances and without the consciousness we're just spending so much money on the stuff that looks like it's going to do x y or z without realizing how much that adds up hey christina i have a new motto yeah it's middle school math <laughs> <laughs> love it perfect i mean yeah, i remember I got, when i got you rich on i got rich on middle school middle math school i'm just math. saying that's all it takes is middle yeah, school that's math. crazy right. yeah. yeah i'm not having to do any trig to have a balance sheet <laughs> um, and I want to thank you. I actually um, remember when you were starting out and, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who has the, I think my biggest character defect is like, I can figure this out myself, mm -hmm. but I can't because the knowledge that I have is based on the knowledge that I have. And I need to have input from other people. Like Don is doing a lot of work to bring that dynamic into to Epic. And um, anyway, I'm very excited about that. So but I, I, you know, I think I'm going to get a sign on my wall. It's just no, because I, my goal is to do 10 minutes on my numbers every day. Well, now it's the, what, the 18th? What's 10 times 18, you know? So, um, and, you know, it's kind of an offshoot, but I really believe that God is in the numbers, that, that there's a power greater than me that wants to, me to be more powerful. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm just going to do it. Okay. Yay, good. Yeah. I like your pen in your mouth. Good, Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying to book an appointment with her in the background. Yeah, here. me too. Oh. I've got it over here. Like, <laughs> Thank you so much, Christina, for being our guest today. I know we have these calls during the day, and a lot of agents are out working and doing things, but I have a really high recording watch of these calls. And so it's going to be promoted everywhere. And hopefully agents will really um, seek you out and have that call. And I'll just put that link that you shared in the video when we share it so that if they want to book a call with you, they can. Yeah. Awesome. I would love that. And, and anytime, if you guys want to come in, want me to come on and talk about a specific topic on money, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, I go general, like in these type, but I'm, I can drill down on anything. And it's something just to keep in mind. Like if we would have done this talk, like how to sell 10 more, Christina Wise is going to tell you on how to sell 10 more houses this year guaranteed or something. We probably would have had 50 people on here. Again, and more about that making more money. Oh my God, and she's going to tell me how to sell 10 more houses. And yeah, that, that is good information, but that's what causes people to show up. You know and what? That's a disservice is that wealth is not in the 10 more houses. Wealth is in this message, but people don't want to hear this message. And, and that's, that's what's difficult. And again, I just go back to that 9%. It's why only 9% is because it's listening to like, oh, Let's test that out, Christina. Would you okay. like to come back next month and let us do that title and let's see yeah. if we can build That'd a house? <laughs> let's do it. That'd be so fun. Let's do it. That's great. Let's do it. Jess and I are the, the committee who choose. So we're just going to choose you yeah. and now we'll rename it. I'll get a different picture from you and we'll title <laughs> it how to sell 10 houses by the end of the year. Let that be hilarious. Let's test okay, it. let's do it. That's gonna be great. <laughs> I'll even come up with some good stuff on. Okay, how yeah, and now you know what it is. So you're gonna have a bunch of okay. realtors in here who are, you know, kind of in a panic right now. Like our worlds, for a lot of them, our worlds have just changed with NAR and everything. So there's a lot of lack and scarcity and and fear. And so how to sell 10 houses by the end of the year. You customize that talk however you want, and okay. we'll do it same day third Wednesday um, at three o'clock next month. All right. Third Wednesday. Let me write that down. So I'll get it on there. And I'm going to book a call with you so we could talk about it a little bit more than two. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day and we'll see you back. Bye guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye guys. Bye ladies. Bye.